Today I'm joined by Kerry Potthast. <music> Kerry is a triple Olympian, bronze medalist at the 1996 Olympic Games, Olympic champion 2000 and a Volleyball Hall of Famer. Welcome, Kerry. Well, I'm about to sneeze, so <laughs> just Perfect. a minute. <laughs> oh, good. Just as you were introducing me, I'm like, I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> oh, that's gone now. Sorry. Sorry, whatever, sorry, sorry. Do whatever you, you want to do, do it again. It's okay. It's all good. <laughs> it, it's, it's much more natural like this, isn't it? I know. That's hilarious. Yes, I'm good. I'm doing great. Thank you. How are you? Thanks for having me on. It's my pleasure. Gary, we both lived to the 80s and I saw you always were, you were always wearing your cap the other way around. Is it kind of an over the top thing that got you into the right mood to compete? It's funny because it started because I cut my hair so short one time that I couldn't actually put it back in a ponytail and there was no way I could keep it out of my face. So I just put my cap on and I didn't normally wear a cap. I used to just have a ponytail, but I put my cap on and then I realized that it was stopping my vision. You know, I'd have to really put my neck back a long way and it was a completely different um, atmosphere, you know, having a, a peak there and having to look up and not see anything. And so having to put my head right back and I didn't like it. I didn't like the feeling of that. So I just turned it around. It kept my hair off my face and it, it was good to wipe your hands on to, you know, when your hands got really sweaty. Uh, so it became, yeah, it became part of my uniform. And then in the end, it was so much part of my uniform, like my, my swimsuit that I, I just had to have it. It was, it was just part of it, part of the game. Okay, cool. In your athletic life, what was your darkest moment? Probably um, the end of my indoor volleyball career. I'd played professionally in Italy for one season. I really enjoyed it. I was going to go back again. And I came back to Australia in between and was playing in the national championship, was in the final with my city, my state, South Australia, And um, we'd played so well and I'd played really well. I was just coming back off the back of, you know, a professional season in Italy. I'd been representing Australia for 20 years, indoor, uh, sorry, 20, 10 years indoor volleyball. And um, I will never forget the jump. I, I was on the right-hand side of the court and I went up to, to hit a ball across my body, across court from the right-hand side. And at the last moment, I changed my mind and, Instead of hitting it cross, I decided to hit it hard straight down the line. Well, it got blocked out. And as that ball was rebounding next to me, um, I was landing and it was landing. And I thought, well, I'll get that myself. And as I landed, I twisted, but my foot stayed facing one way. My whole body twisted the other way. And I completely ruptured my cruciate ligament. I ruptured my medial ligament. I wrecked my meniscus and my cartilage all in one jump. So I completely destroyed um, my right knee. Um, it was my darkest moment, but it was because of that that a year and a half later, I found myself on the beach and went yeah. on to playing three Olympics and winning two medals. So it's just incredible when, it, you know, something really bad happens to you that something great can come out of it. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I've spoken to a few people here and it seems like that the dark, for a few, the darkest moment has always been before the best moments. Absolutely. And they really test you and they test, test your purpose, your why, your, the reason why you're doing what you're doing. If, the, if that reason, if that purpose is not strong enough, then you won't go back to doing what you were doing before. But if that reason is really, really strong. So for me, I just love the sport of volleyball. I love the community. I love the um, challenge of, of playing volleyball and even more so beach volleyball. And um, yeah, when I had the opportunity to give beach volleyball a try, I just jumped at it, <laughs> literally jumped at it and realized that I just, it was so much easier on my knees And it gave me another 10 years of representing Australia. So I can really proudly say that I played for Australia for 20, over 20 years. Cool. How did you recover from that moment? Well, it was interesting. The first three months I had three surgeries to try and fix the damage. I had a lot of problems with scar tissue and the scar tissue adhering. So, you know, 
not enabling me to move my joint very much and that the surgeon had to go back in and remove more of the scar tissue and um, eventually I was able to start moving it. But by this time I'd lost about 10 kilos. Um, I was really kind of, I wouldn't say I was depressed, but I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't know what the future held at that point. And it was only because um, a boyfriend that I had at the time gave me a brand new white volleyball. And he said, on every panel of that ball, I want you to write a goal. And then I want you to put a date on that goal and then bit by bit, get back to playing, you know, follow it and get back to where you want to be. And at that point, I thought it was playing indoor volleyball for Australia again. So I filled the ball out um, and it was just part of the household. It was, you know, thrown around. We played with it in the house. People would come over, they'd look at it. They say, oh, what's your goal for this month? And I'd be like, oh, well, riding the bike, just, you know, getting on a bike and riding the bike, or it might be um, just, you know, standing and, and passing. And then it became setting and moving. And, you know, eventually I got to the point where it said playing for Australia again, but of course I never really got there because there was one panel on the ball right at the end when I finished everything, there was one blank panel left and I thought, what am I going to put on there? And I just wrote beach volleyball on there. I, I'd never really played it seriously. I played it for fun when, you know, in between seasons of indoor and I wrote beach volleyball and as a, just an afterthought, I, I remembered that beach volleyball, I knew that beach volleyball would be an Olympic sport for the first time in, in the Atlanta 96 games. And I was filling this ball in, in 1993. So when I filled it in, it was a three year away thing, but I just wrote there, Atlanta, United States, you know, 1996. And it was almost like I wrote it as a joke in the beginning because I couldn't possibly even see myself playing at that point. It was just like, that's what I'll do after I've played indoor. Um, and of course, after a year, I realized that the floorboards were just gonna to be too hard on my knee. And so I tried beach volleyball and realized that it was gonna be so much more forgiving on my joints. And it, you know, obviously gave me a, another, another avenue. Cool. I heard you talk about the concept of being a good loser and a bad loser. Could you explain what uh, the difference is? Well, I was probably what you'd call a bad loser in my younger days. Um, I hated losing. I remember when I was about 10 years old and we played this game at my birthday party and I lost the game and I was crying, you know, at my own birthday party because I lost. So I didn't know how to um, deal with losing when I was young. And it, you know, I guess it took many years of, it drove me, I guess the fact that I didn't like losing, it really drove me to find a way to be better over and over and over again. And eventually, um, I don't think, I don't think you can ever really get good at losing. I don't want to get good at losing. Who wants to get good at losing? But I think um, you can become a better loser by not losing your temper, you know, not blaming people. Um, you know, really taking more responsibility yourself and looking back and saying, well, how could I have done it better? And that's what I learned between the two Olympics in 96, between 96 and 2000, I really learned that, you know, I needed to, and we as a team needed to just take more responsibility for our own journey. And um, yeah, we did a lot of things in that period that helped us win the gold medal. Cool. What was your best moment? Obviously, you can't go past winning gold in Sydney. Um, I live in Sydney. I, I didn't live in Sydney at the time, but I always knew that I'd come back to Sydney. I just lived in Sydney on, you know, a month here and a month there before. But I knew I would settle down in Sydney. But having a home crowd was, it was frightening in the beginning, but in the end, incredible to win a gold medal in front of our home crowd with my family all my friends and then all the people that had been part of my indoor volleyball journey to that point, you know, as soon as we made the final, if they weren't already in Sydney watching the games, as soon as we made the final, they came, they, they got in their cars and they drove however many hours it would take to get to Sydney to make sure that they were at the final. Um, and yeah, the moment that, that the ball landed and, and we realised that we had won is just the most unbelievable moment because to get to that point you know I was so focused it was almost like I was in a 
a kind of silence, you know, I could hear the crowd, but I wasn't listening to them. You know, I could, I knew that my family was there, but I didn't know where they were in the crowd. I was so focused. I was so in the zone. And when the ball landed out and all of a sudden you realize that's it, we've done it. It's just, it was just like all these people just went, you know, right on top of me. And um, I, I was almost too scared to look up and, and see all these people um, just cheering and screaming and, and being so happy for us. It was a really a weird feeling in the beginning, but then, you know, over time and still 20 years later, it's a feeling that, you know, I'll never forget. I believe that. Interestingly, I heard one of your whys to become Olympic champion was to inspire others and lift others up. Why was that? Yeah, well, part of our journey was to really understand why we wanted to win a gold medal. Our coach said to us one day, why do you want to win a gold medal? And a lot of athletes, I'm not sure whether anyone ever asks them that. And it was like, well, of course, it would be great because, you know, we'll have a gold medal and we'll be able to say we're gold medalists and, you know, we'll make a lot of money. That Most people think that when you win a gold medal, you're going to make all this money. It's going to just come to you. It's going to fall out of the sky. And that's absolutely not true. Um, but, you know, you think all these great things are going to happen. And then he just kept digging and digging and going, well, why would that be good? Well, why would that be good? Well, why would that be good? And one of the reasons, and we had a whole list of reasons And one of the reasons was that both Natalie and I loved helping other people. And I wanted to become a teacher before I started playing volleyball. And I never got around to doing finishing unit or even going to university because I went straight into playing volleyball professionally. So um, I like to teach people and both Natalie and I have done a great job at using the vehicle of winning the gold medal to inspire people and to help other people with different areas within the sport and in the corporate world. Um, and now something I'm doing is helping athletes to share their stories to, you know, their networks as well. So it's just an ongoing thing that we really both, we realized that both of us wanted to do that and that by winning the gold medal, that would be our vehicle to be able to help other people and inspire other people. On your journey to becoming an Olympic champion, you had a success coach. What is a success coach and how does a success coach work? Well, you can call him a success coach. You can call him a performance coach, a mindset coach. You know, different, there are different words that can be used for, for a person um, like the coach we had. His name is Kirik Ashley. And we found him, you know, a year and a half before the Sydney Games. And we realized there was one thing that we really probably didn't have a hundred percent of, and that was belief that we could actually do it. Um, we'd come second and third many times. I've got, you know, 20 other world tour medals, um, but none of them at that point were gold. They were all silver, bronze. We'd had fifths and ninths and, you know, we'd had 17th and 25th as well, but we had, we knew we had a chance, but we just didn't quite have that last bit of belief. And so when we met Kirik, um, just talking to him and talking, he, he comes from the Anthony Robbins style of coaching, um, much about your thoughts, the thoughts that you keep and the attitude that you have and being able to, you know, steer those thoughts in the right direction. And that takes a lot of skill, a lot of planning. You, you need to understand why you're doing what you're doing like we did. That was part of the process that he took us through. But you also need to be comfortable with being uncomfortable and being comfortable with growing every single day and being okay with, you know, if I'm growing, things might not be so great at the time that I'm growing, you know, learning a new skill or breaking down a skill to be better at it, you know, all of a sudden you're not so good at it and you had to kind of mentally, there were so many things that he helped us with along the way. And he really helped us design our plan um, towards the Sydney Games, which was called our Gold Medal Excellence Plan. And that was all about becoming an Olympic gold medalist in everything we did before the Olympics. So from 18 months leading into the Olympics, we acted like we were gold medalists, which just meant we trained like a gold medalist would train. We ate like a gold medalist would eat. Uh, eat. Uh, you know, our nutrition was like a gold medalist would, would use. Um, 
our, uh, the way we just looked after our bodies in recovery, um, the way we worked out in the gym, that would be, we'd look at it in the way that, what would a gold medalist do in this situation? And that's how we lived our lives for those 18 months. Um, and we also said, what sort of characteristics do successful people have? So we looked at sports people, but we also looked at um, people in business that were really successful and said, what characteristics make somebody really successful? And we came up with a list of characteristics that um, for us, they suited our personality that we were comfortable with. And we lived into those characteristics. We always made sure that that was who we were being um, because all those things together would, would create the thoughts that we would keep. And then those thoughts would create the actions that we had. And then of course those actions would create the results. So that's what Kirik did for us. He really filled that last piece of the puzzle to create, you know, a full um, complement of team that we had. We had a volleyball coach, we had a fitness coach, and we had our success coach. So we had three coaches dealing with our body, our mind, and our volleyball, basically. I've taken a note for that gold medal excellence plan for later, but now since you're talking about it, There was an interesting story. It had kind of four elements and then there was a fifth element in the middle and then you aligned it kind of with the, like the Olympic rings or something? Yes, actually, I've got it here. Just one second. Should have taken it out before. So this is the plan. That's cool. For those that can see... This, it's in Olympic rings. It's the color of the rings. And our coach very cleverly, um, our volleyball coach actually, very cleverly designed it to fit into those rings. Um, but of course, it's called Gold Medal Excellence. We had a little logo for our team because our coach said that every team needs a name, needs a logo. So it's just a big star with a volleyball. And our name was the Dream Machine because it was our dream to turn our bronze medal into a gold medal. And the five of us were a machine and without any one of the people in that group, if someone was not in that group, we, our machine wouldn't work properly. So that's why we called ourselves the dream machine. Um, and then in the middle, we had our, our slogan, which was, how can we make it better? So that was where, you know, when you're talking about being a good loser, instead of focusing on the loss or blaming other people, blaming the weather, blaming the referees, blaming whatever conditions, It was like, okay, this is where we're at. Let's start looking forward now. How can we make it better? So that's what we focused on. And then we all signed it. And then it traveled with us. It's, it's laminated and it, we stuck it on the wall everywhere and it traveled with us. And, um, you know, every time, you know, after a loss or a win, you know, you'd go in the bathroom and you'd be brushing your teeth or whatever. And, you know, it would be sitting on the wall and you just, or on the mirror in the bathroom and you'd just read it and go, oh, yep, 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 yep. So it had, you know, the four areas, the purpose, that was our why. It had this area, which were our rules. So we didn't have rules like, um, you know, make your bed, sleep eight hours, things like that. They were just general things. We had rules around our partnership. So things like respect others and their opinions, use deeds rather than words, do whatever it takes, be responsible for empowering communication. So they were all things around um, our partnership and our teamwork. Then we had that green circle and that was all about volleyball. So that was all the things that we knew we had to do to beat every team in the world. And we called that our winning way. And we had things like intimidate with a champion's physiology Meaning, you know, go out there and look like you're a gold medalist before you start the game. I mean, if you walk with your shoulders back and you, you know, you're looking like you're acting like you're confident, not arrogant, but confident, then that's going to, you know, bring out the extra points and maybe even scare the opposition. <laughs> um, play our strengths, uh, use our strengths to attack our opponent's weaknesses, um, execute our game plan, limit our unforced errors to Uh, five, I think, per game, push in the beginning, hold in the middle, push at the end, change, uh, challenge the passer with service pressure. So all volleyball things. And then the, the third, the last, fourth one was the characteristics. So we called that our standard of champions. And we had things like there in there being um, 
be strong in emotion and spirit, be powerful, certain, passionate, con committed, trusting of the system and the process, be positive, supportive, um, be ready, be flexible. So I had all sorts of different characteristics that we made sure that, and basically at the end of the day, if we were able to do all this, basically from there, there, those three circles, because this one was our purpose, this was our motivation, this circle. Whenever things went wrong, we looked in here, if things weren't going well, and we went, why are we doing this? You know, why am I waking up this early every single day? Why am I traveling the world and missing my family and my friends? Why am I, why am I making these choices? And those reasons in there reminded us why and got us back on track. And then if we followed the rules, did all the things to beat everyone in the world and had, you know, lived into those characteristics, we would be the best we could be. And that was, that's what it's all about, being the best we could be because we knew that we were just that close from beating the best teams in the world. So that was our plan. We made it, you know, to the peak of the mountain to play the, the best team in the world at the time, which was Adriana and Shelter from Brazil. And they'd won everything. We beat them one match about three months earlier in a world tour event. I think it was even not even a, in a final. It might have been in, could have been in a quarter final. We beat them. And then the very next weekend, we played them again and they beat us back. So we really, it was a strength of mind. The belief that we had to have on that day was not about, it couldn't come from the fact that we'd beaten them before. Like for them, they would have believed, oh yeah, we've beaten these girls 16 times out of 17 matches. Like no problem. The gold medal's ours. Maybe that's what they were thinking. But we were also doing this going, this is our match. This is the one we're waiting for. We have, you know, the last 18 months have been all about playing you in the final. That's what we did. The whole time we practiced playing at to, playing to beat that team because we knew that if we could beat that team, we could beat any team. Mm. This gold medal excellence plan looks like a Simon Sinek, why, how and what, but long before he did it, right? Yeah, probably. I mean... Our coach, it, it just kind of happened. We didn't plan to do it like that. And I'm not sure they planned to put it in the Olympic rings, but just like my volleyball, you know, having all my goals on the volleyball and looking at it every day, it reminded me of what I wanted to do, get back to playing volleyball again and just do all the little steps. So having this in front of you, I think the important part is when you make a plan, it's not about making the plan and then putting it in in your diary or somewhere or, you know, not taking it with you on tour, you've got to take these things with you. You've got to look at these things every single day. Um, you know, in business, if you have a plan, it's got to be up on the wall where everybody can see it and everyone's going to be part of creating that plan as well. Because if our coaches just gave us this one day and said, here's your plan, off you go, it wouldn't have meant anything. But we spent a whole weekend together putting this, you know, two, three days, putting all this together with another, a whole lot of other activities. But the five of us um, put our brains together and we came up with this as a collective. So that's why it was so powerful. Is that plan available in your book? Yes, it is. It's available in my book. Um, I wrote this book, so about 10 years ago now, um, but it's still very very current because obviously it's all about mindset and it's all about our journey. Um, it has a lot of exercises in there that you can do yourself. The, the plans in there, I talk about the plan. Um, it's online now. I don't sell hard copies. I've only got about five hard copies left, but you can buy it online and it, it, you can get a print on demand um, or you can buy it like an e-version. But I wanted to, again, I wanted to pass on what I'd learned. Yeah. And I didn't want to just write a, a biography and tell my story. I wanted to make it mean something and, and be able to leave a legacy of all of the lessons that I've learned. And one thing that I was really passionate about, uh, Natalie and I were, was trying to make an income while we were still playing that wasn't just prize money. We, we needed to find sponsorship to travel. We needed to get the media involved in what we were doing. So we learned a lot of skills around that area. Um, and I wanted to, you know, showcase that for people as well. So I talk about all those things in the book, um, how we did it and all the planning that went into it, you know, everything from, you know, how to do a budget. I tried to put even more information in there. So 
an athlete could pick this book up and go, oh, what shall I talk about to read today? Oh, public speaking. Oh, hydration, nutrition. Oh, fears and doubts. Um, attitude. You know, and at the front, there's, you know, sponsorship, uh, generating other income, time management. So there's so many things in here. I wanted to really make it comprehensive, which I did. Um, I was actually advised to make three separate books, but I didn't want to. I wanted it to be one book that an athlete could just grab and, like, devour, but also go to any chapter as well. And then, of course, there's photographs and little stories about my own journey to kind of enhance all the information. Yeah. And it's called The Business of Being an Athlete? Yes. The Business of Being an Athlete. Um, how to Build a Winning Career in Sport. Yeah. And it's available on carrypodcast.com or uh, you? You're better off going through, you know, just one of the Amazon or oh. I don't even know, just Google it. <laughs> Because I like I said, I've, I don't have any hard copies now. I think you have to get them print on demand. Like it's 10 years old. I don't really promote it anymore. But I, I've, be, I've been thinking about doing a rewrite of it and updating it. But, you know, that just takes time. I've got other things to do. <laughs> <laughs> I checked it out. It's on Amazon. It has only five-star reviews, so it has to be good. Oh, good. There you go. Quickly coming back to that gold medal excellence plan, if you would advise any person to make a plan for their life or their goals, what would be the must-do items or must-have items on that plan? I think it would be your purpose. You know, why? Ask yourself, why is it that I have this goal? So obviously you're putting a plan together because you want to achieve something. Ask yourself why. And then when you come up with an answer, ask yourself, why is why that answer? Why is that answer important? And then again, why is that important? And really start to peel the layers of the onion until you get right into the core of the reason why you want to do it. Um, and that, that why it could be a number of things like it was for us, or it could just be one thing, you know, um, you might just want to leave a legacy for, for your family. You might just, it might be that you want to create an income from what, whatever your goal is that then allows you to save the world and, you know, you know, save children or something like that. Whatever your passion is, whatever your reason and your why is, That's the most important part because without that, there is no way you can get back up when someone punches you and, and knocks you to the ground. There's no way you'll, you know, you'll keep going when you're injured or when you've lost or when you've, you know, you've just hit a roadblock. You, you just won't have the strength. But if you have a strong enough why and purpose, absolutely will keep going. So it's worth writing it down. It's worth doing the exercise. Um, and there's an exercise in the book. Um, about why you're doing what you what you want to do. It's real, really worthwhile writing that down and, and just really getting into it and journaling it. If you could travel back in time, 10, 20, 30, even 40 years, what advice would you, would you give a younger you? What do you mean 40 years? I'm not that old. <laughs> no, I would, uh, you know what? I, w I would tell myself, The, the moment that I went to make that spike when I injured myself, I'd say, don't jump for that one. Just do a little, little soft shot so I wouldn't injure my knee and then switch to beach volleyball with no injuries because one of the most difficult parts of my journey and still of my life right now Are the, ish, are the problems that I've had with not just that knee, but then the other knee as well. Because once you have one knee injury and then you want to keep playing and you keep pushing and pushing and pushing, then the other knee takes the strain. And then I, you know, I talk tore meniscus in the other knee. Then when that knee was being, you know, rehabilitated, I tore more cartilage in the bad knee. Then it was the other good knee. I tore a massive piece of cartilage off that knee and I had to have drilling in my bone. And so I've had six knee surgeries. I've now also had stem cell therapy on my knees. Um, and, you know, I'm not really looking forward to old age. Um, so, yeah, that's the only thing I would say. Be careful of your knees. <laughs> <laughs> What are the habits that make you a successful athlete and person? Well, I think um, probably you have to 
you have to eat well, you know, really important nutrition because it's the fuel that makes your body get up each day and do what you did the day before and do it even better. Um, you have to have a good habit around recovery. I was not very good at that at all. And I probably didn't, that's probably why I kept on injuring my knees because I didn't do my recovery as well as, as well as I could. And these days recovery is so, so much more advanced than it was when I was playing, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago. Um, so recovery, nutrition, and then just have a good habit around mindset as well and really always check back on yourself and check back at, am, do I have the right mindset right now? What, what are my thoughts? Where, where am I thinking? What, where am I going? And have a habit of always, you know, having that plan in place and, have, and asking and having a team around you, I think, is really important, um, making sure that you're not doing things on your own. You described the three keys to success for almost anything in life, passion, preparation, and belief. Yeah. Well, you could probably hear the passion in my voice and when I talk about what I've done and how I've done it. I still, I'm still passionate about sharing my story. So, and that's why I now want to help other athletes share their story because that's my passion is sharing stories um, to help other people, help inspire, motivate, educate entertain whatever it is um so passion you've got to be passionate you know so you can get up each day and you know put in a, a good day of work or whatever um preparation that it's the hard work you know it's the strategies it's the it's the work in the gym it's the work on the court or in the field it's it's the work at work if you're in a corporate field um it's preparation is just about the work And then belief, as I said earlier on with our success coach, it's that last piece of the puzzle that um, comes with all those things, the passion and you've done the work. And when you've done the work, it gives you greater belief and then being comfortable with being uncomfortable and having that plan and the vision and, and putting it all together creates that belief. Um, so with those three ingredients, I just, I, you cannot go wrong. You will be the best that you can be. You might not be the best in the world. It just depends on who else is, you know, doing what you're doing um, at the time, but you can most definitely be the best you can be. Mm, cool. And you talked about it before. You always had that mantra, how can we make this better? Can you quickly talk us through it, how you applied it? Well, we learnt this in Atlanta when uh, we, were, we were the number six seed in our first Olympic Games and we had a quarterfinal match. We played pretty well. We had a quarterfinal match. Our first Olympics were still pretty nervous, pretty, pretty raw. Um, and we had to play the top American team of Holly McPeak and Nancy Reno. And they were favoured to win a medal, if not a gold medal. And we had a really strong game against them and we just beat them 15-13. And it's a massive upset because I'm, I'm not sure what they were seeded, possibly even the first seed. Um, massive upset. And uh, we, you know, we were obviously pretty, pretty excited about that. And then, then our semi-final match, so we get into the finals, our semi-final match is against the Brazilian team, Adriana and Monica, who we'd beaten before quite a few times. So it wasn't this thing that, oh, my God, we're playing someone we've never beaten before. We'd beaten them before, but they were a solid team. And, you know, going into this game, um, we really started to worry more about losing than think about winning. And that just crippled us and we got absolutely thrashed. Yeah. Um, so coming home from that match, I still remember we were both so devastated because it was a big chance. That was, you know, our goal was to win a medal in Atlanta. And um, unfortunately, you know, now we only had a chance of maybe a bronze. You know, we could have still come fourth. And so, you know, a few things happened. We got inspired and motivated and we started to think more about how can we make this better? What can we do to, to, to change and turn around our attitude and everything, our, everything that was going on in our mind? Because now it's a mind game. It's not a physical game. It's a mind game. Who's going to be strong enough to win the bronze medal? Um, 
And overnight, we, we had some great experiences of watching other Australian team, or other Australian athletes winning a gold medal in the swimming pool where they were written off. They came in with the worst time in lane eight and, you know, they won a gold medal. So from that experience and watching that happen, it just gave us the motivation to go, okay, how can we make this better? And we got together and put a plan in place. And the next day we went out and we had to play the second American team um, who was a little bit lower seated, but are still possibly seated above us um, in America with everybody cheering, you know, for them, not for us. And we beat them in two really tough sets. So, you know, from that, we really learnt that it was about looking ahead and how, how can we make it better, asking ourselves that question. Mm, really cool. Yeah, and something that when I listened to podcasts you were featured in, you already mentioned that, and you mentioned, wait, let's put it like this, you mentioned the name Tony Robbins. You also said the goal at 96 was to get a medal, so you got it. But the goal in 2000 was to get the gold medal, so you got it. So where you put your mind to, you kind of achieve it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And we, our goal was actually, rather than our really focusing on winning the gold medal, our goal was to just live our lives with gold medal excellence. So by focusing on this and, and our goal being, you know, let's just be gold medalists, you know, a year and a half beforehand, let's just live our life like a gold medalist. It was almost like the gold medal, we'd pick up the gold medal along the way. So it wasn't an end point. It wasn't the, the be all and end, end point. It was just keep going past it. And um, to that point, we even um, started thinking about the night before the gold medal match, we found out later both of us were lying awake, trying not to keep the other one awake um, because we wanted to get some decent sleep, but neither of us really slept very well. But both of us were lying awake practicing or thinking about what we would say on our victory speech. Mm. So we were already thinking past the gold medal. Mm. So we knew, I knew at that point that by having those thoughts, my head was in the right place. Cool. Do you have a morning routine? Now or then? <laughs> Maybe both. <laughs> Now it's just make myself a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> sit down and check my emails, um, make my son's lunch for school, take him to school. Um, then a morning routine, look, not really. I'm not a, I actually, I'm not very good at routine. Believe it or not, I'm not good at having a routine. I find it really difficult because I get distracted and I think, oh, I've got to do this. Or every day is different because I'm, I'm more, um, I have my own business. I don't have a nine to five job every day is actually different. And the only thing really that is, is solid is that my son goes to school at a certain time and he comes home at a certain time and everything else can change during the day. So sometimes I'll go to the gym. Sometimes I go for a walk. Sometimes I might do Pilates and it might sometimes be at nine o'clock or it might be at two o'clock. So that's just, yeah, that's just me. And um, I do understand having a morning routine, you know, for some people is really, really valuable though. Especially if you don't already have good habits. How do you prepare for important moments? Now, and even when I was playing, making sure I knew exactly what that moment was going to be and what I needed to do, what I needed to know about the moment. So if I was playing a game of volleyball, I needed to know exactly what this team had done before. Um, I, I wrote notes about every single team we played, even if it was the lowest ranked team in the world, I would write a note after we finished the match about the match. So I could go back to every country. It was, you know, in countries, I had a little black book and every country and every team that we played, I'd go to the country, I'd find the team. Sometimes a team had split up. So I would look at the players then and go, this is what happened when we played them last time. These were the conditions. This is what worked really well against them. This is what they did. You know, they served me or they served Natalie. If they served me, they were always blocking cross court. So then I knew that that was coming and I could, it would just give me a head start into what to expect. And same goes now if, I, if I'm going into a meeting or I'm about to do uh, a new project, I need to prepare. I need to know about it. I need to, you know, go into it 
knowing what's what's about to happen. I was piqued by something you said in another interview. You learned from the army about the vagus nerve and that you can reset that nerve by hitting your chest. <laughs> How do you yeah. do that? Well, in the last couple of years, I've been involved with the Australian Institute of Sport and there's a program called that we have called the Gold Medal Ready Program. And some of the sports psychologists have, have teamed up with gold medalists, myself and another 20 or 30 other gold medalists from all different sports and from up to 20... 24 years ago um, and um, we've teamed up with the commandos the special forces unit because they are under a great deal of stress in what they do i mean they go and and they go to you know many times overseas and they're fighting in wars and they're having to you know have you know they've been on missions i mean i can't even imagine it. it's just mind-blowing what they have to deal with life and death situations so they're under a lot of stress The point of the Gold Medal Ready program is about understanding the stress of trying to win a gold medal and the stress of going to an Olympics. Now, it doesn't compare when you're saying life or death, but what does compare are the strategies that the commandos use in order to deal with that stress. And so what we've done is come together and it's, it's really a lot of storytelling. And so we've come together and we offer our group to the sports. So some of the sports, um, or all, you know, all of the sports, it's available to all sports in Australia, Olympic sports at this point. And it's about getting the athletes in that sport who are preparing for an Olympic Games and putting them together with us. And we have a structure, we have, we have a, you know, a learning platform, but it's about coming together and sharing stories about, well, This is what happened to me and this is how I dealt with it. This is the strategy I used. And so the commandos do it from their point of view, from what's happened to them and how they used to deal with things, which makes the athletes kind of just go, oh, wow, what I'm dealing with now is nothing compared to what these guys deal with. And then they hear from the gold medalists about, you know, how gold medalists might have been vomiting before their finals or were so scared that their knees were shaking or, or they had this strategy to deal with some distraction. And so the athletes can then relate, oh, that's how I feel, or he's just like me, or she's just like me, you know, and so there's a lot of um, great greatness that comes out of that in experience to help the athletes prepare them for what they have to do with to go to the Olympics and to win a gold medal. How oh, sorry, and the vagus nerve, yeah. apparently, it's just the three thumps, and I use it sometimes If I'm nervous, because I still get nervous sometimes if I'm speaking on stage or if I'm about to come on something really important um, and I just give myself three thumps with just a flat fist, just three thumps, and it resets the nervous system. Okay. Um, now, whether it works, you know, whether it, it doesn't just kind of make you go, oh, you know, obviously, but I do it. It's, it's a scientific, there's a scientific reason behind it. Um, I've tried it. Seems to work for me. Give it a try. Look it up. It's called the vagus nerve, and it's a reset. Yeah. See how you go. Really cool. How do you overcome setbacks? Doing everything I've just been talking about. <laughs> 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 Having a really strong mindset. I think that that is the biggest part of it, and that mindset is is built by. Um, focusing on the things that I've talked about, especially in our gold medal plan. So knowing what your purpose is, having some rules around how you engage with your team, um, you know, understanding how to bounce back from losses, all those sorts of things, dealing with nerves, you know, all those sorts of things help in dealing with a setback. So these days, you know, with the coronavirus, obviously the world has had a massive setback. I think that all the strategies that the athletes have learned in their athletic careers will be helping them go one more year and mm -hmm. practice for one more year. Um, it, and definitely those strategies have helped me in my life with other setbacks, you know, mm -hmm. in my own personal life. Yeah. And interestingly, now it becomes, it comes full circle with what you said about preparation. If you do the preparation about your why and your values, you overcome setbacks. Absolutely. 
I tried to find the information you and Natalie, your partner, you won the Olympic with. You played together, you split up, you, re you re reunited and you won the Olympics. What was the reason for splitting up and reuniting? After winning a bronze medal in Atlanta, we, we thought we were pretty good. You know, we got really like, oh, yeah, we're really good. We don't have to train as hard anymore. You know, we, you know, we did more media. We, we got distracted by other things, all the shiny objects. And we didn't perform as well because we weren't doing the same sort of work. And um, because uh, when we started to perform less well, we started to blame each other. And I started to look around and I said, well, is there somewhere else, someone else I can play with maybe? And there was a girl that had just come out of the indoor national team and she was starting to play on the beach and she had pretty good skills and she was a left hander. I'm a right hander and she was six foot tall. And I just thought that maybe her and I would be a great team. And so we decided to split up and I, I picked up um, this partner. Natalie then picked up a young player who was coming through. So someone a bit younger than her and less experienced And my partner and I played really well. We were the number one team in Australia. We even got a couple of silver medals on the world tour and had some great wins, but it was a really difficult partnership. We personality wise, as hard as we tried, we just didn't get along. We, we just didn't gel. It's like being married to somebody completely opposite and wrong for you. And then you have to make it work. And we tried and we tried and we tried for almost a year, but although our results on the court were great, our hearts were like, oh, it was so hard. Mm. And I sometimes explain it. And she felt the same way about me. It wasn't just one way. And I explain it, trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. It doesn't work as, as, as you know, much as you can try. It just doesn't work. During that time, Natalie um, really went through a life-changing experience and met our mindset coach, Kira Cashley. And he started changing and, and really working on her confidence and her um, her mindset. And I saw that happening. And then it came to a point where I was just getting, it was so difficult for me and my partnership. And I was starting to think maybe Natalie and I could get back together. And it was because of, it was because of another player's injury. It gave us the opportunity. We were playing in Marseille in France and two of our Australian girls went down with knee injuries, both requiring surgery and they had to go home which meant there was opportunity to shuffle the partnerships around. One, one of them was Natalie's partner and one was another team from another team. So Natalie was free and I said, you know what, I want to play with you. So we, we ran it by our coaches and it was okay with them and the world tour because of the injury um, ruling, they said we could do it. The other two ended up pairing up and they made it to the Olympics and finished fifth. Yeah. So it was a great opportunity for the other two as well. They, they found it and they clicked really well. They enjoyed playing together. Within the first two tournaments, Natalie and I were back together. That very tournament, we came second. And then the week after, we came second again, only losing to the best team in the world. So we knew we were in the right place. Mm. Who's your role model and why? I don't have one in particular role model. I look at... I look at a lot of people depending on what I need to do at that point of my life. Um, oh, it's just a, a weird, like one person. I remember being at the beach and we were doing some setting training where you set up your attacker and I just went, Oh, I feel like one of the Australian men's players, Julian. I'm like, Oh, I feel like that. I, and that was kind of the feeling that I wanted to get of, of remembering how he would handle the ball. So that was just one tiny, tiny um, thing that I remember. But then there were things that I would, you know, we'd had different coaches over the period that we were playing together and I'd take a little bit from everybody. And then I'd see something happen in a game and I'd go, oh, I really love the way that person does that. Or I love the way that person is on the court, their persona or their personality or just the way they, you know, their friendliness or whatever. So I just, yeah, there's not one person. I take what I need at the time from you know, other people looking around. And that is also what you describe in your book with the modeling process that you used, right? Yeah, exactly. And I, and I still do it today. If I want to write a book, I'll look at somebody who's written a lot of books and been successful at writing a book. I won't go to somebody who ha who's had no success. So it, that's a real clue right there. Like if you're looking to do something, don't take advice 
if you want to make money, don't take advice from broke people. You know, if you want to play volleyball really well, don't take advice from someone who's not done it or been there or has coached somebody that's been there and has played at the top level or coached at the top level. Don't take your number one advice from some anybody less than that. Go to the top if you want to be at the top. So I do that in every, you know, every area of my life. So right now I want to teach other athletes how to share their story. I went and and did some work with one of the top speaking training coaches that I know and that I respected as well. Um, and I worked with her for a little bit. I understood what she was doing and, and I start to model myself. And then I'm like, okay, I've got that. Now let's have a look at what that person's doing or what that person's doing or what that person's doing and take a little bit from everybody to make the best for me. And, Obviously, we can't go into detail here, but can you give us a glimpse into the steps of that modeling process, how you describe it? Just pretty much what I did then. I, I decide what I want to do, and then I, I find people who are doing it really well, and then I copy a little bit of this, copy a little bit of that. I, I copy the way they do a skill, or I love the way they express themselves on stage, and I'll copy it, but in my way. So it's just taking a little bit. Sometimes I overwhelm myself <laughs> because I've got too much information and then I'm like, oh, my God, how do I decipher all this information? Because you can't do everything at once. You cannot, if you want to learn how to spike a ball and you're trying to learn how to do the footwork, the, the you know, the, the arm swing, um, looking, um, doing all the different things and you're trying to do it in the wind, in the, the rain, in the, quiet conditions like you can't try and do everything at once you have to pick a little piece of it at a time and I think that's probably my biggest weakness is that I try and get all this information together all at once and it, I, I become overwhelmed for a period of time and then nothing happens and then all of a sudden bit by bit I pick a little bit of it and I go right let's put that in okay pick a little bit more right let's put that in and like this is not some perfect process it's just what I do and sometimes it takes a long time and sometimes it's a lot quicker I just have to get that push to get going and then I'm on on the roll in momentum what is the best advice you received and who gave it to you oh again there's it's not one thing that I remember um I think all the great advice that I've re received have been from my volleyball coaches. So first of all, my, my indoor volleyball coach, Sue Dancy, she was always, you know, it was always about winning. It was always, always about hustle. It was all about grinding, you know, just work, 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 and just be aggressive. Um, and then from Steve Anderson, our volleyball coach for Atlanta and Sydney, anything that came out of his mouth was, was inspirational. Um, Probably repetition. One thing that I do go with a lot when I'm coaching volleyball is about repetition. And he, you know, he used this from somebody else as well, but repetition is the mother of all skills. So, you know, just let's rep it. And he used to just always say, stop thinking about it too much. Let's just rep it. Let's just rep it. Okay, make a little change. Now rep it. No, don't talk about it again. Just rep it, rep it, rep it. Um, so he was good. And then obviously our mindset coach, Kirik Ashley, who helped us put all this together. Again, you know, um, one piece of advice he gave me after one of my relationship off the court, my boyfriend and I broke up and it was really affecting my whole being because obviously I didn't want it to happen. And, um, you know, he just basically said to me one day, you know, there's no way you can move on to another relationship if you're still the way you are right now because that person doesn't want to be with somebody who's like you are right now. It was kind of, that was really weird. Oh, and then another person said to me about that, and he was actually one of my sponsors. He said, it's a long time in a pine box. Actually, that's probably the best piece of advice. You can relate it to anything. It's a long time in a pine box. And that means pine box being a coffin, right? Oh. So we're going to be, A, like dead for a long time. We're only alive for a small period, a small speck in the ocean. 
So make the most of the time we have while we're here. That is absolutely cool. Back in the days, how did a typical training day look like? Um, two or three hours on the sand and then another hour um, in the gym or in the pool or doing some sort of conditioning work, sometimes some recovery, massage, um, cold baths, whatever the recovery was. I wasn't very good at it, remember. <laughs> Uh, and then um, some planning, team meetings. But, you know, it, it was, we, we used to actually go three days on, one day off physically because by day three, my knees, that had enough and I needed that one day rest. Whereas a lot of our athletes now go five days on, two days off or five, six days on, one day off. There's no way I could have gone five days as hard as I did. So to get the best out of my knees, I'd have to go hard like, Medium, hard, medium, have a day off. Medium, hard, medium. So, you know, I could really kind of warm up into it and then give, it a ch give my knees a chance to rest. You recently hosted The Athlete Story, bringing together legendary Australian athletes from over seven decades. What was the idea behind it and where can people find more about it? Well, about... Um, Well, it was about February, March this year when they announced the Olympics would be postponed. And that's when I said to myself, I've got to do something. There's going to be this period where Australia and even the world, but Australia loves sport. And Australians would have been glued to their television sets. We normally have multiple channels that you can flick through and watch all the different sports. It was going to be in Tokyo, which is the same time, you know, almost the same time as us. So it would have been you know, during the daytime into the evening. And it would have been just that period where everyone gets all this motivation. And then because of the pandemic, it was a time where I thought, this is what people need as well. We don't want to just be like, oh, the Olympics would have been on. Oh, well, it's not. We're stuck at home. We're doing nothing. And we're, you know, we're depressed. So I wanted to bring some inspiration to Australians, but also to the athletes who are sitting at home as well. You know, look, looking back, they can, you know, or look at the time, they could be watching their heroes that maybe inspired them to get into the sport. So I connected with my network, which is obviously a lot of Olympians and in particular gold medalists. And I said to them, would you be interested in doing this for me? Two of them every night. So I had over 30 Olympic gold medalists and world champions. And I also wanted to connect it with a charity. And we have a charity called the Australian Sports Foundation who helps grassroots and community sport, which, had been, which is still hurting a lot financially because there's no events, no community sport. So there's no money for clubs and they do a lot of work to help, you know, raise money to help community sport and clubs. And so I thought if we could raise some money from the series by just asking for donations, we didn't raise a lot of money, but we raised them a bit of money, but we also just gave the foundation some awareness. People hadn't, you know, who hadn't been aware of the foundation before. So I just wanted to create something that was a win for everybody um, and the athletes get to share their stories. It was fun doing it. It was a, it was a big uh, project because obviously I needed to research all the athletes every night. I had two athletes for 17 nights in a row um, and, and I just hosted them. So I didn't share my story until the very end. I shared my story at the end, but I was sharing, I was hosting um, the stories And again, it goes to what I want to do now in the future because I've been telling my story and earning an income from it and just creating great opportunity through sharing my stories. Became a commentator, um, was able to write my book because I knew what my stories were. I knew how to share them. And so I felt that I, this is something I now want to pass on to other people. And so this was a great platform to just share stories from great athletes around the country um, and just get the name out there, the athlete story, which is now what I want to be doing in the future. And, and that's going to be available for people online. So it can be a course that people can do anywhere in the world. Um, and also face-to-face -face workshops with me and some one-on-one -on -one coaching, because at some point you, it's about like drawing the story out of the athlete. Because some athletes don't realize they have a story. You don't have to have 
you, number one, you don't need to be an Olympian. And number two, you don't need an Olympic gold medal to, sh to have an amazing story. Everybody has an amazing story. It's just about getting that story out, shaping it to make it, um, make it entertaining, make it inspirational, perhaps, if that's what it is, and finding the lessons in there that you can then align to whatever group that you might be speaking to or it might be just... It might be just doing an interview with you, being able to share a story in a way that, that inspires people. And again, it's about inspiring people. I, I want to be the ripple. I want to create a ripple effect from what, what we achieved and, and continue to help other people now create their own ripples um, of inspiration. And it's something the world will never be, um, never be sick of, I don't think, inspiring sporting stories. Really cool. And where will it be available? What will be the name and uh, website URL? Yes. Yeah, so all of the interviews that I did with the Australian gold medalists, they're all on YouTube. Um, and the YouTube channel is called The Athlete Story. Um, my courses, which I haven't completely built yet, because I, this is what I do. I say I'm going to do something and then I go, uh oh, now I'm telling everybody I have to actually do it. So once my course is ready, it's not that far away from being finished. Um, you can access that through my website, which is theathletestory.com.au. Um, but just by looking up your, my name, you'll eventually find it anyway. So I'm on all the social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram. Um, I don't really use Twitter, uh, but also LinkedIn, and it's just my name. Really cool. Yeah, I, I've, I've seen most of the interviews you did and uh, it's really cool stories. I would love to talk to a few of these people. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to nominate someone to be interviewed? Do I want to nominate somebody? Um, someone in what country? That's up to you. In volleyball? Anything, an Olympian? Well, I mean, there's, there's obviously so many, but I'm just thinking of somebody in the Netherlands or someone in Germany. So my background is German as well. So my parents, both born in Germany, came over here with my brother and I was born here in Australia. You can so see I have from a, the surname. A <laughs> yeah, yeah. Have you interviewed Laura Ludwig? Oh. Well, there you go. Interview Laura Ludwig. Tell her that I said she must do the interview. Really cool. It's, it's funny. It seems like the Germans are a bit hesitant talking to me. Uh, the people who are the, seem to be the most open are Australians and Canadians, funnily. Well, maybe we need to... Maybe they don't know how to share their story. Maybe, they don't, maybe they're not very good at it and they need some training. <laughs> maybe. What's going on in the life of Carrie at this moment? Well, uh, like I said, I'm building my, my new project, um, The Athlete's Story, helping athletes share their story. I am still waiting for events to, to come back on so I can get back on the, the corporate stages and, and tell my story from there. And I'm doing a few virtual presentations, um, which is, yeah, not as fun as being in person. <laughs> This is my studio. Um, and... Yeah, just look, just coping with, you know, COVID, the pandemic, um, helping my friends out if they need help and uh, can't wait to start traveling again. And I just heard that we may not be able to leave Australia until June, July next year. Really? Which was pretty depressing. <sighs> and I'm like, oh my God, I just want to come overseas. I want to come to Europe and visit all my friends. I have so many friends all over the world. So, yeah. Cool. Kerry, you are the fourth Volleyball Hall of Famer I interview. And all, one thing all of you have in common, you are very generous with your time. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. Thank you for um, asking us to come on.